Good everybody. Now I think we're recording. Good morning. My name is Professor Devin Kenyon uh, from Santa Clara University School of Law. Welcome to our August meeting of the Law School Council. Uh, before we do sort of roll call, I want to welcome our newest member, Dean Mary Beth Moylan. Uh, Dean Moylan, you want to briefly introduce yourself and tell us what school you're from? Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Moylan. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at McGeorge School of Law, part of University of the Pacific in Sacramento, California. Great. We're, we're very excited to have you. Uh, uh, when we do roll call, why don't we have the rest of the members introduce themselves in their school then just to sort of stay on track. Uh, uh, we'll have some additional folks joining us later as well. Uh, why don't we do, we'll jump down to public comment, which is the next thing on my agenda. Uh, as the chair, I reserve the right to limit the duration of public comment. Uh, please use the raise hand function, sort of as always, all of us are now Zoom pros. If you're a phone person, you can use star nine to raise your hand and the bar staff will recognize you. Is there anybody to be recognized for public comment? Not at this time. Great, thank you. Then we will close public comment. Uh, when am I, oh, I missed roll call. Like I said that out loud and then zoomed right past it. So we'll ask the bar staff to please call the roll. And uh, when we do so, please everyone just introduce yourself and say your school uh, for the benefit of Dean Moylan. All right, we'll start with you, uh, Chair Kenyon. Uh, I'm present, Devin Kenyon from Santa Clara University. Uh, Susan Bakshan. Mary Beth knows me, but I'm from Loyola Law School. That's great. Uh, Nydia Duenas. Hi, Nydia Duenas, Southwestern Law School. Uh, Christopher ID Don, who uh, alerted us he won't be in attendance. Mary Beth Moylan. I'm here. Uh, Grace Hum, who said she's uh, going to be a little late. And uh, Don Smythe. I'm Don Smythe. I'm at California Western School of Law. All right, I think we have four. Great, thank you. Uh, the next agenda item is the approval of the minutes from the April 20th meeting. Uh, are there any changes to those minutes? Uh, seeing nobody wildly raising their hands, I'll ask for, uh, oh, uh, do we, do, we don't need to do a motion a second, we just do a roll call vote, is that correct? I would do a motion and a second. Okay. Who moves to approve the minutes? So moved. Second, anyone? Second. second. Thank you. Please call the roll. All right. Uh, Devin Kenyon. Uh, approved. Susan Bakshian. Approved. Nydia Duenas. Approved. Uh, Mary Beth Moylan. I think I should probably abstain since I was not here. Okay. Um, uh, Grace, uh, Don Smythe. Approved. Do we have enough for it to be approved? I think so, yes? Yes, the motion carries. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll move forward to staff reports. And first up is Audrey with the report on the July 2020 bar exam. Good morning, everyone. As you all know, uh, the July 2022 bar exam was Tuesday, July 26th and Wednesday, July 27th for the majority of applicants with um, accommodated applicants with extra time testing over extended days. Um, we had approved 8,148 applicants to take that exam. Um, we had 7,543 actually attend, so 588 no-shows and 17 partials. That's sort of how the numbers broke out on the day. Um, we had 15 total testing sites. Six of those were the hotels with our accommodated applicants. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other questions. That's sort of how the numbers, we were back in person, of course, as you all know, back in person for February, back in person for July. We will be in person again for February, 2023. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Yes, Devin. Uh, great. Thank you so much for the, the numbers. It's really interesting. Is that number of no-shows sort of typical in our sort of current sort of bar exam age? Is that high? Is that low? It's it's 
typical for the in-person, I would say that we had a slightly lower no-show rate, uh, no-show rate remotely, <laughs> but it's pretty typical, yes. Good. And the other sort of question is about sort of the, I know when we talked about the February exam, you all had sort of described some you know, difficulties getting proctors back because of the sort of gap and sort of people getting back into sort of shape at running the very sites. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering what sort of you all saw in terms of how July worked. Um, I know for, I was at the Santa Clara site and it seemed to be running sort of smooth, but very slow. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was true of other locations, but I would just like to hear more about that if you could say anything. Well, I think, yeah, we have a variety of, fac of factors with seasonal, proctors to come work these exams just twice a year. Um, and as we probably talked about in February, we have um, we have somewhat older proctor uh, population in, in certain test site areas. And not all of those have been coming back post, post pandemic, if that's where we are, but back, <laughs> back in person. So we did do uh, a lot of different recruiting through a vendor for July. We retained um, some of the new proctors from February to July. So at least we had those experienced folks coming back. And we have a lot of ideas for proctor recruitment for February and next July, because it really is an important, it's such an important role um, to have those folks ready to hit the ground um, for the exams, but it is a tough, it's a tough recruitment. So I think, yeah, I think we have um, lots of good ideas for next year, but we were still not able to get a lot of the proctors who used to pre-2020 come are, are still not coming back. Can you say anything about sort of how the general flow of the sites ran from sort of your kind of opinion of having done this before in the before times and in the now times? Um, you know, similar, I think. Um, if you've been to a large test center, which it sounds like you were, it, there is a there's a lot of logistics. There's a lot that goes on um, to get everyone seated and ready to begin the exam. So I think that um, yeah, getting everyone checked in. I think what we um, had in February, we had a different level of um, vaccination check and different kinds of uh, ways to clear applicants to come in the door. And so some of that, uh, not having those uh, that need for state and federal guidelines for July, we didn't have that issue with check in. So some of that. So it really, you know, I think overall it was very similar to how we might have been in prior July exams. Um, but there's every large site has definitely, you know, there is the time to get people seated, and that can vary a little bit. Yeah, I see a Susan. No, okay, Mary, you Beth, you're on mute. That's okay. That's a Thank classic. You. Sorry meeting. about that. Um, I put my hand down, but I had one more button to press. Um, so I wanted to chime in because I, I had heard that the Sacramento site was mm -hmm. also quite late. So um, things got off, I, I think Devin's characterization, smooth, but really slow. Mm -hmm. The students were still there at 6.30 at night, I guess, on the first night. And um, I wondered about whether there's a role for law schools for recruiting and training proctors. Obviously, um, for some of our staff, summer is a slower time. So mm -hmm. particularly for the July bar, maybe tapping some of the law schools um, for staff members who already do kind of know some of the protocols and have worked with ExamSoft before and that type of thing. Maybe that would be helpful. Maybe you're already doing that. It's just a suggestion. I appreciate that. And I used to work at Golden Gate University. Um, I saw all the proctoring that the law school had there, but we do not recruit from uh, law school staff um, for some conflict of interest reasons. So the, I, I appreciate the suggestion, but we don't recruit that way. Nydia? Hi, hi, Audrey. I was curious if there were any um, kind of like gaps to be filled in terms of students and their understanding of like exam administration um so we southwestern we've been having uh remote exams and we'll be returning to in-person exams um this fall um and so as we've been gearing up and just informing students i quickly realized the gap that they've had in terms of like the in-person exam administration um, and then when you answer with it being like the bar exam I was curious, did you notice that my students kind of like unaware of the process of the in-person examination and are there gaps that we can be failing, failing to get students uh, prepared? 
I'm, I'm having a little trouble. I don't know if I'm the only one um, hearing you, but you're talking about like a knowledge gap because they've been taking remote exams and then how how they were prepared on the day for an in-person. Is that okay? Well, I think what helped is that we sent those Friday emails for six weeks, kind of trying to get everyone ready for what will it be like? What is your admittance ticket? <laughs> Why do you need a print? We tried really hard to get the uh, communication really clear for applicants before the day of, but I think you're right. I think, well, for some of them, a lot of the um, applicants for July are first time takers, right? So if they had been taking remote exams all the way through May or June in law school, there could have been a knowledge gap about what to expect for in person, but we really tried to send those Friday emails for six weeks before the exam and make sure the law, the law schools were looped in as well. Um, also, there's all sorts of Reddits and Facebook pages that they all read to prepare each other. So, um, Devin. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to sort of second what Nydia said. Even though we had been back at in-person exams throughout last year, the sort of exam skill set was much, it continues to be much weaker, and I think we'll sort of see it for years. Uh, one sort of thing that comes up and is very funny to me, but sort of I realize like for our students is kind of surprising is the fact that on the MBE day, they do that without a computer and on a Scantron. Mm. Because I don't know about other schools, but our school, we don't use Scantrons for anything anymore. Um, and so, uh, and it's, you know, as I read through sort of the bar documents, it's like in there, but I think if you're not looking for it, it's not really clear. So as you all think about sort of communication for the future, yeah. be really clear about Yes, number two pencil, ye olde days from when you took the LSAT. Well, not even some of them now have taken the LSAT on computers. So, mm -hmm. not even that case, like back when they took the SAT years and years and years ago. Uh, because uh, I had students on the that Wednesday show up at their laptops and be like, What do you mean? I and I was like, You know, you missed the message for months now. And so it, it's surprising to them. I think that's a really good thing to in our future communication to emphasize because it is uh, NCBE requirement to do the Scantron and that is something that um, yeah I don't know when the last time well I haven't done a Scantron laptop when the last time they would have done a Scantron another thing it's a really good thing about in person but if you're laptop uh, fails, you can switch to handwriting. And I think a lot of the, because um, we couldn't do that remotely. So that just mean, meant that they would be a partial, you know, and they wouldn't get their exam graded. So it's a good thing about in-person, but I think a lot of the applicants who had to switch to handwriting that, you know, they weren't used to handwriting either. So it's just it's just a tough thing mentally to switch to. Um, Susan? I just had a quick suggestion or idea that I, I agree, the Scantron thing was a problem. And, and I know we all saw it for six weeks, but they didn't. And they're overloaded, obviously. Um, but I wonder if it would help if Tuesday night when they are wrapping up for the day, if there was actually an announcement that said, mm. don't bring anything tomorrow except number two pencils, do not bring your laptop, and actually tell them on their way out the door at the end of day one what to do day two that's different. And we do have announcements on Tuesday nights, but uh, definitely looking to emphasize that makes sense. Thank you, Susan. Nydia? Also, along those lines, one of the conversations we're having right now, because we also moved towards exemplify for multiple choice assessments during um, the pandemic and sort of push our department in that direction. Um, but we've been having the conversation about for our um, MBE course, which is our, you know, multiple choice bar preparation course that we would use Gantron for that course so that our students can get used to, you know, like this is a bar focus course and we're going to do it with Gantron so they have that preparation for, for the bar. So we're going to have a conversation That sounds really helpful. Oh, and, you know, honestly, at the, uh, the Office of Admissions, we're reviewing our forms, our website, a lot of things about um, how we're getting the applicants ready, not just for the exam, but for all their touch points with us in the Office of Admissions. So all of this uh, feedback for me is really great, and we'll definitely get more law school feedback um, as we move through this process of, you know, making sure that everything we have out there is clear and people know what to expect, even from the registration as a law student. I mean, all the things we've talked about at these meetings before, and all your help is really great. So thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments for Audrey about the July exam? Great, thank you for that update. Uh, I think that you are also the next, next update on provisional licensure. 
I am. I'm playing the role of um, Amy Nunez today. So let me share my screen and I will update you on provisional licensure. Can everyone see my screen? Hmm. I did something with the videos. Sorry, one second. I have that presentation, Audrey, if you'd like me to share. Oh, so well. it's okay. I did something now where I shared and the video suddenly got covered. <laughs> it's just me, I think. All right. I just want to minimize you. Sorry, this is not interesting for you. Okay. Okay. Is everyone seeing the notes version of this or just the slide? It's the presenter version. All right, well, maybe Robert, you should share. Sorry, uh, that was a fail on my part. Are you able to see that or see the slides? Do you is see it my slides? desktop? It's yeah, your desktop. It's desktop. Sorry, I apologize. Is that better? A nice scene of someone running. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> okay. Now let's see. How do I? What's that? All right. Perfect. Thanks so much, Robert. Um, so the provisional licensure update today, I'll be doing something similar this afternoon for the other law school meeting. Um, next slide. So we're looking at the statistics as of this week, very up to date on where we are with the program. So between the uh, 2020 grad um, version of the program and the expanded program, there are a total of 300 active provisional uh, provisionally licensed lawyers. Um, approximately 1,166 provisionally licensed lawyer participants have been admitted to date to the bar. 629 of those sat and passed the bar and another 537 uh, in the expanded program worked the 300 hours, received a positive evaluation from their employers and were part of the group that had that 1390 um, cut off from the prior five years. In the remaining cohort, we have 15 suspended applicants and 104 terminations. Suspensions could have resulted from not satisfying the moral character requirement, and perhaps the um, applicant is appealing that. Terminations occur as a result of not meeting the rule, so um, not completing the new attorney training program, for example, which we have extended several times, trying to give folks an opportunity to complete the required CLE. Um, total, in total, 1,585 applicants have participated in this program. Next slide. So looking at the breakdown um, of race and ethnicity of our provisionally licensed lawyers that have been admitted, um, you can see that um, the majority, 42.8%, uh, identify as white, and then the next highest um, group would be Asian at 18.8%. And you can see the further breakdown there on the slide. Next slide, please. Um, so the next slide looks at law school type, uh, California ABA schools being um, the majority, 36%. And then we have the Cal accredited schools following at 26.6%. Um, and then you can see the further breakdown there of which law schools are represented in those licensed. Next slide. Um, so looking at uh, the gender of those licensed through the provisionally licensed program, um, 55% female. Um, and then you can see the further breakdown there as to how these provisionally licensed lawyers and now licensed lawyers identify. I believe that's the last of Amy's slides. Any, any questions? I can see, oh, there's the hands. Uh, yes. Team Smythe. I'm sorry, you're on mute. 
I'm just a professor. That's why I still do. Oh, sorry. I always do that. Everyone's a dean in my life. <laughs> Uh, it was great to see the stats uh, and the breakdown by ethnicity and uh, gender. Uh, some comparative stats would be especially helpful, though, to know whether the provincial the provisional licensing uh, program served as a, a better pathway uh, to uh, a, a license than the the usual just sit for the bar mm -hmm. uh, and uh, write it until you pass a, approach. And we have the general statistics posted on the website by exam, um, but I agree to have them kind of side by side would be. Can you give us uh, some basic summary of uh, how the provisional licensing program fared in comparison to the usual? Honestly, well, off the top of my head, not looking at the general statistics, I think I actually think that breakdown is somewhat similar in terms of the, um, the way people are licensed generally but i wouldn't i don't have those numbers in front of me susan i just wanted to clarify one point because it's come up on the blue ribbon commission about the pll's that those numbers of terminations and suspensions those are not discipline those no. are folks who voluntarily left the program because they passed and all kinds of other things and or their moral character has a glitch or, yeah. or and so I just wanted to clarify that, that, that those are not folks who have somehow done something wrong as a PLL. Oh no, that's a good point. I mean the terminations um, might mean they just did not do the required CLE so they didn't complete the program. I mean like so yes, not a, not a disciplinary matter. Thank you for that clarification. Are there any other questions or comments for Audrey about the provisional licensure program? And I assume we'll keep getting updates as long as the sort of people are working through it. It sounds right. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, the next agenda item, I think, is Natalie, and that is for a recommendation that bar staff has put forward around the elimination of the five-year timeline for validity of passing a passing bar exam score. Natalie, you're the next contestant. Okay, thanks, Devin. Um, so this is uh, not so much a substantive discussion about this proposal, but just a reminder to law schools that uh, may want to submit public comment about a proposal. So I'm going to share my screen and um, just remind folks um, how to do that. So this is an example of a pending proposal that um, is uh, very likely of interest to law schools. Um, and if you go to our state bar website and up in the search box, type public comment, uh, you will be able to see all of the, the rule proposals that the Board of Trustees is considering, including this one. Uh, you'll be able to look at the text of the material and see how to submit public comment. Uh, this particular proposal is the elimination of the time limit on the validity of a passing bar examination score. So uh, here, I know that many of you are aware that people have five, that um, applicants, uh, once they are successful, need to be sworn in within five years of the date of the bar exam that they passed. Uh, this proposal would lift that restriction. Uh, the, the, this has gone through the Committee of Bar Examiners, been discussed at the Board of Trustees and placed out for public comment. Um, and if your school would like to make a public comment, you can go uh, search for the public comment page. You'll find it here. You can see the full text and then you'll see an online public comment form. Uh, they'll be taking public comment on this particular item uh, through September 12th, 2022, um, and your comments are welcome. So I know we talk about this generally, but once in a while, it's nice to reinforce the actual process so that um, everyone at the school will know uh, where to go to uh, make those comments and um, help the Board of Trustees uh, in making their decisions. Great, thank you, Natalie. And I will just sort of take the chair's privilege to sort of encourage everyone to both read that proposal and assuming that you or your school has an opinion about it, just submit public comment. It's sort of something that impacts sort of some of our alumni. So, Susan Batch. Just a, a quick question, and maybe Devin, you can help me. Uh, I have not been following that that particular proposal or its work. Are there any particular um, opposition points or something that would be helpful for us to address that's misunderstood about getting rid of this rule? 
um, if, if there's some if there's some direction that you could give us on what might be helpful or what the critique has been that we could address, that would be great. I'm, I'm not aware of that in particular. Um, we do have Donna in the audience um, to, and uh, generally if she had a comment about that, she would raise her hand. Um, I, so no, I don't believe so. It's really just reinforcing that general process. Oh, Donna is raising her hand. So uh, Robert, if you would promote her to speak for a moment. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, one of the um, questions that has been raised um, that it would be interesting to, to hear the opinion of, uh, of folks on uh, with regard to that proposal is the, um, well, let me take a step back. So the, um, the way that the proposal is structured, um, instead of the requirement that somebody meet all of the requirements for admission to get certified to the Supreme Court and get sworn in all within the five years from the date of uh, the bar exam that they passed, uh, the proposal says that individuals would, um, um, uh, if they don't get sworn in, if they don't get sworn in within five years from the, uh, if they, I'm sorry, if they don't get, um, yeah, if they don't get sworn in, if they've been certified to the Supreme Court, so they've completed all of the requirements for admission, right? They've completed, they've not only passed the bar exam, but they've gotten their moral, moral character and they've been certified to the Supreme Court. So all they were missing was getting sworn in. And ultimately they did not get sworn in within five years from uh, from when from from the date of the exam that they passed, I'm sorry. From the date of uh, well, if they, if they haven't gotten sworn in within five years, it's been a while since I've focused on this proposal. Um, they need to. They would get decertified from the Supreme Court, and they would need to um, redo their moral character. Um, generally, moral character applications have a three-year uh, lifetime, and they would have. They normally have to get. Uh, extended, uh, reevaluated at the end of every three years. And there's a process for extending your moral character after three years. Once you've been certified to the Supreme Court, however, um, you're, uh, you, we've told the Supreme Court, they, the person possesses them, the character and fitness that's necessary for, uh, for a lawyer. Um, and so uh, one of the questions that has come up is what if, what if that happened five years ago? Um, and um, and you haven't gotten sworn in, should you be required to re-up that within three years, the way you would have if you hadn't been certified to the Supreme Court? So, that, so that's the one, that's one, of, that's, I'd say the primary question that we were hearing as we were exploring this proposal is whether having your moral character um, last for five years in this instance because you have been certified to the Supreme Court uh, makes sense or whether that should be reduced to three years as part of this um, proposal. So if people had thoughts on that, certainly it was some that would be something that um, along with anything else we'd entertain, but that would be, I'd say the one issue that we were hearing um, questions about was the length of time that the moral character application uh, the moral character determined positive determination might last before having to be reconsidered. I want to thank Donna for pointing it out. That was one of the I, I read this proposal when it we got it in the email, and that was the sort of thing for me where I was like, I have I don't quite understand how these line up. Um, and so you laying it out helped me a little bit, and I certainly want to reread it and actually talk to some of my colleagues who teach PR sort of to get some sense about like what do you all think about this. Uh, but sort of Susan said, like, is there something that was the thing that jumped out at me was like, how do these two timelines overlap with each other? And, and you know, I generally I support the idea that, you know, giving people more time to get sworn in feels fine to me. But if there are other sort of moving pieces that attach to it, I definitely feel like they all need to be addressed holistically. Yeah. And I mean, otherwise, I think, you know, there is a visceral response, I think, um, from some when they read the proposal that says, well, we need to ensure that people maintain 
the minimum competence necessary to be a lawyer. This seems like, you know, they shouldn't let 10 years go by before they get sworn in. How do we know that they maintain the minimum competence? In which case, I would point you to the agenda item, which really compares and contrasts somebody who passed the exam, met all the requirements to be licensed as a lawyer, um, versus somebody who who got to did the same thing, got sworn in, and then went inactive. Um, you, right, you're never assessing that person's minimum competence again in terms of an exam. Everybody possesses the duty of competence under the rules of professional conduct, um, rule 1.1. Um, everyone is expected to uh, 1.4 to meet that to meet that duty. Um, but am you know am I any different? And I I maintain my active status, frankly. But I've never set foot in a courtroom. Um, you know, it, it, if I were to set foot in a courtroom tomorrow, would I be any more competent because I maintain my active status than somebody who passed the bar, met all the requirements, but just didn't get sworn in six years ago? Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments about this or the public comment process, which I know is Natalie's focus? Great, thank you very much all. Uh, please take time to review the proposal and submit a public comment on your own behalf or the behalf of your school if that is interesting to you. Uh, we, I had a note on the agenda that we had a special set on access to justice at 10. Are they here and should we move to that item? Yes, we do. Um, I would like to ask Robert to recognize Jack London um, from the California Commission on Access to Justice, uh, who will be here to give an update on some of the recent work of um, that commission. And I see him on the way. I'd like to thank Elizabeth Hom, um, Director of our Access and Inclusion Program, and also Jack London uh, for uh, reaching out and collaborating with us uh, to bring this information to you. Thank you, uh, Natalie. If either uh, Judge Mark Uhas or uh, Catherine Blakemore is on, could you promote them too, as well as our communications manager who's going to help uh, Jasmine Kodura? Uh, I'm, I'm Jack London. I'm executive director of the California Access to Justice Commission. Uh, this is a, a get acquainted presentation. Catherine Blakemore has joined and she's the vice chair of the commission. Uh, the Access to Justice Commission has existed for uh, 25 years. Uh, for two years, it has been an independent nonprofit organization. And I, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine to tell you a little bit about the commission. Then I'd like to tell you something about our student loan related focus right now. Good morning. And I think is Jasmine sharing the slides? Did we want to do that? Yes, I'll do that now. I can do that. Oh, go ahead. Thanks so much, um, Jasmine. And good morning, everyone. It's great um, to be here and just talk a little bit about the California Access uh, to Justice Commission. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so the, we work to advance civil justice for all Californians, um, expand resources for low and moderate income people, and reduce barriers to civil justice from use, developing some innovative solutions to do that. So we wanna give you just some examples of that and talk a little bit about who our partners are, which um, I think the next slide just identifies the partners. Um, so we work in collaboration with all of the uh, various appointing authorities, which include the Supreme Court, um, other branches of government, um, and we have really valuable collaborations with the California uh, Bar. Um, and um, other organizations that are lo located on that slide. So we have about a 30 some member um, commission um, that meets quarterly and does a lot of work by its um, various um, committees. Um, and then the next slide, Jasmine. Um, you'll see two things here, which are our annual report. Um, all of that's on our website, which is calatj.org. And um, I'm gonna just do a couple of highlights from the annual report. Um, in the last year, one of the things that we were given the opportunity to do is to provide some innovation and infrastructure grant funding um, to organizations that uh, served 
that serve low income Californians, which is now at the 200% of poverty level, um, as you might be aware. Um, one of those grants actually went to um, a law student uh, clinical pro law school clinical program that had um, applied. Um, and um, that that um, that we awarded grants to um, about 47 different organizations um, and are really excited about the work we're doing. I mean, what we realized is the impact of COVID and the sudden shift to you know, working from different locations impacted legal aid organizations and others. And uh, we're able to uh, help organizations develop some capacity to increase their infrastructure for what looks like a at least partial continuing work from home environment, and then some innovations, different ways of providing legal services um, that people wanted to try. So very exciting. Um, I'll let you know that that funding has been continued for another year, um, and an announcement about that will be coming out um, uh, sometime this, uh, this fall for applications, um, and we can um, certainly um, make sure that um, Natalie or others get that in case you're interested in looking at that for your um, for your clinical programs. We also um, did some innovative work ourselves of developing um, a mediation program to help with the um, eviction tsunami, looking at what rules of courts would need to be changed to be able to more effectively mediate cases with um, an eye towards ensuring that uh, individuals could and landlords could avail themselves of the government money that was available to settle back rent claims. Um, I think as many of you know, the eviction tsunami was not as much of a tsunami. And um, so there was maybe less need for the mediation, but some really good ideas about how to approach mediation and best practices for trying to resolve mediation in unlawful detainers, um, which are a big area for low income people and have a big impact on courts, I think was quite um, helpful. Um, we are currently working on a proposal to uh, with the with the state bar um, to develop and market test public communications in an effort to address the knowledge gap. The bar did a really good job with its um, justice gap report, and there's both the who can provide direct legal assistance through legal aid and other programs, but there's also the the challenge that many people don't actually know that they have a legal problem, and one of the ways to help. Um, identify solutions for that is to test whether people identify an issue as a legal problem that they would be in need of legal assistance uh, for. So um, that work is just starting now, and um, we would look forward to the opportunity to talk uh, to you more about that um, later. There's real opportunities, I think, ultimately for uh, particularly impacting uh, modest means individuals who are above the federal poverty threshold, but still don't know that they have legal rights and some solutions um, to that. And then just um, as a way of transitioning to the presentation Jack's gonna do, you'll see up here our report on legal aid recruitment and retention. Um, we are concerned about the challenges that legal aid programs have in recruiting and retaining uh, lawyers to work for them. Um, and me meeting the justice gap need means that we need to help uh, legal aid programs uh, be able to recruit and retain more lawyers. It's a combination of salary and loan debt from law school that is really significant. Um, one of the things that we are focused on is looking for more creative solutions to um, reducing um, loan debt um, and ensuring that people can fully access the public um, law school uh, loan forgiveness program that's a uh, available through the federal government and some of those changing rules. So I'm gonna turn it over to this point um, to Jack, who's gonna talk about our work in that area um, and some opportunities for uh, you and your students um, to be better informed about, about those. Let me begin by saying from the begin, from the outset of the Access Commission, we've had active participation by law school professors it's something that we welcome and would like to increase. Uh, there are, uh, there can be opportunities for clinical classes to participate in research with us. If you look on our website, you'll see an impressive series of uh, papers reporting on issues involving uh, rural communities and, and obstacles to their access to justice. The state bar last year 
uh, funded us to do this study of legal aid recruitment, retention, and diversity. And in looking at the uh, principal issues, it, it wasn't uh, a mystery why there is today a crisis in hiring in California legal aid programs. When I say crisis, what that means is uh, a, a good challenging legal aid job can currently stay open for months. And this is a terrible problem right now because the legislature has stepped up in the last two years with very substantial additional funding. There will be $80 million for legal aid programs from the, the general fund alone, along with IOLTA funds. And that's in addition to federal legal services corporation funding. If you have that much additional money and can't hire, uh, our, our public policy has gone wrong. Uh, the, if I can share my screen here a minute, uh, I'll show you a, can you see this? This is, this is a comparison of uh, starting and uh, five year in salaries between legal aid programs and public uh, salaries for lawyers. The, in the most competitive uh, jobs for legal aid lawyers is to go and work for the government. And you'll see a $25,000 gap at the starting level currently uh, between legal aid lawyers and uh, lawyers in the same uh, communities and a much higher gap at the uh, at, at uh, higher uh, levels of experience. The reasons for that gap are, are clear, but legal aid programs can't be faulted for the reluctance to spend money on increasing the salaries of existing lawyers rather than hiring new lawyers and spending money in other ways that, that adds capacity. However, it's a crisis. Uh, our uh, work suggested that the most efficient way to spend money is on loan uh, repayment assistance projects. And to, and to do so on a tax exempt basis. There are two provisions, you, you probably are familiar with this, uh, of the uh, Internal Revenue Code that allow legal aid organizations, and one of them is open to uh, other nonprofits, to make payments for loan repayment assistance that are not, uh, that are excluded from taxable income for the recipients. Uh, your law schools may do this. Uh, if you if you don't and are interested, we are presenting and the state bar is sponsoring this as well, uh, a, a program on loan repayment assistance for the law from the law school perspective as part of the law school assembly on September 29th. Uh, could I see the next slide if I can? We can get the screens back. Uh, Heather Jarvis is a very experienced and very able. Uh, trainer on student loan issues. And she will be making the presentation uh, to law schools who participate in the assembly on September 29. I, I, I urge you to get that to your colleagues uh, because these are important subjects, not only for your students in their future, but also for law schools themselves. Uh, she'll be talking not only about ways of implementing loan repayment assistance projects but also about the changes that are underway to the public service loan forgiveness program of the Department of Education. She is one of the advisors to the negotiators in the negotiator rulemaking and intimately familiar with the new rules that will come into play next year. Uh, th this is for, I guess, understandable and unavoidable reasons under the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, 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 quite messy. Terrible rules that led to 98% rejections were replaced for one year. 98% of people who applied for public service loan forgiveness were rejected. Up, up until a year ago, October, when the Department of Education enacted an emergency rule under the COVID arrangements. Uh, that rule will expire uh, at the end of October. When it expires, the old rule comes back into play until the two year period for the new rules, which are now under public comment, to come into play next summer. So it's a bit of a mess. 
Uh, but Heather will be uh, giving you some uh, explanations of that. One thing I just want to pass along, since almost all of you are, are government organizations or nonprofits yourselves, you're, uh, law schools, faculty, custodians, other workers who are employed by law schools uh, can make an application under the limited waiver period, uh, which allows the, the, the uh, allows applicants to overcome past procedural defaults. Things like certification by the employer was late. Things like the payment wasn't in the exact amount. Maybe it was $10 high. In the past, that was excluded as one of the 120 qualifying payments. Those can be forgiven. They can be forgiven for people who've, who've applied, have 120 payments, or have five payments, or, or three years. And just to, to, to wipe those kinds of procedural problems off of your record, you must submit an online application with the Department of Education before October 31. In fact, if any of you want uh, a, a brief flyer on, on these issues to pass along to your faculty and your staff, my email is on the, at the end of this presentation. It's j-l-o-n-d-e-n at cal A-T-J, org and we'll send you something you can pass along. Your faculty members who have student debt should just make an application because it, uh, no matter how far along you've gotten in the process. So uh, let me let me just close and take any questions you want. We are also uh, with the state bar support training uh, legal aid programs on how to set up uh, loan repayment assistance pro projects on a tax advantage basis. We're going to try to organize something. We're looking for funding. And uh, let me just illustrate. Go one slide up, uh, uh, Jasmine. Here's the, the benefit. Uh, take, and these are, these are uh, representative figures. Uh, a new legal aid lawyer has a starting salary. Say she works in Alameda County. $64,000 currently would be, would be typical. Uh, a student loan balance, especially for a lawyer of color, you probably know this, student loan from undergraduate and grad, typically would be on the order of $200,000. On the income-based repayment system, with a reduced pay payment, that's $4,416 per year. Now, that's less than interest. That means that the balance will go up for as long as she makes her payments. If she works 10 years and then goes to a higher paying job, her balance will, let, will then be $320,000, not $200,000. Her payments will be $9,000. And sh she will have paid a, 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 a real uh, price for the way this is set up. Uh, if you take typical uh, federal and state taxes, marginal tax rate is 40% at this level. Her uh, net income after taxes and student loan payments, $45,000. Compare that to the MIT-based minimum cost of living in Alameda County, $34,000 for a single person with no children, $72,000 for uh, a single person with one child, over $100,000 for uh, a family of two with three children in Alameda County. It, it is uh, a showstopper for public service jobs, especially legal aid. Now, this isn't a solution, but a tax-exempt LRAP can, uh, can raise the, uh, the in-the-pocket after-tax costs to, to $50,000, uh, rather income to $50,000, a 9% increase. Th this can be done. It should be done. It's the most efficient use of, of money to help bridge the compensation gap. And we're working on helping programs do that, looking for funding uh, to, to do that. We're, we're really happy to have the support of the state bar on it. And they've, they've been very focused and, and I think effective. So questions. Does anybody have any questions about this presentation? I just want to thank you both for the presentation. I found I found it really interesting. And while you were talking, I pulled up uh, the report. I'm definitely going to share that with some of my colleagues on campus. So we appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, Natalie, go ahead. 
I do. Uh, so I heard a couple of calls to action in your presentation, Jack, and I wondered if I could just circle back around to them for a moment. Um, the first one I heard was the opportunity for professors to participate in the work of the commission. Um, if our professors out in the audience or uh, here who are members of the law school council were interested, is there um, any update as, as far as the timing of the cycle of when to apply or can they find out how to apply from the website? Uh, we are an action-oriented body. We have had uh, uh, substantial impact over the years. Uh, limited scope representation began in the Access Commission uh, in our early years. The Equal Access Fund, which is now at $80 million, was an Access Commission and State Bar uh, suggestion in, in the late 90s. Uh, Language access plan of the Judicial Council was a response to one of our reports. Many of our rural reports have, have had an impact. If you look on our website and see under our committees, we have 12 uh, substance oriented committees. Uh, there are law school professors who are members, but if you are interested in information about any one of them or your clinical faculty or, or students might be interested in participating, all that's welcome and you can contact me. Mm -hmm. there, is no, there is no time deadline or schedule or, or uh, limited window. Thank you. And then I think that presages my second question. If the law schools were interested in getting students involved in research projects, it sounds like the procedure would be the same. Uh, right. Uh, we have uh, limited capacity, but a long list of things and our capacity depends on the help of, of volunteers. On research work, there is work that would be uh, suitable for uh, maybe a clinical class project. Uh, we can undertake things with your help that we couldn't otherwise do. And, and so your suggestions about things that might be done to improve access to justice uh, in the civil side, uh, the outreach of the justice system to disadvantaged communities and, and communities of color, those are, those are all things on which we have practical things to do when we can get the help to do them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then finally, you mentioned a tip sheet for those that are looking to perfect their record to access loan repayment if they can, um, including potentially faculty members or staff members at law schools. Um, I will request that flyer from you for the members of the commission. And if you could just remind the folks in the audience um, how they could access that as well, that sounds incredibly valuable. Well, if you send me a, your, a, a request, I'll send it out to you and we'll get it to Natalie to distribute more broadly. Uh, the Department of Education's website has a, a good tool for determining whether your past payments have been credited. Uh, PSLF tool, it's called, and I'll, I'll, we'll have the, the link to that in our materials. And um, there, I, I would just urge anybody who might be eligible to use the online application for the limited, uh, limited waiver period between now and October 31. It, it will uh, correct uh, some of the, it will correct the waived requirements that were responsible for the 98% decline rate. And it is use it can be used by people whether you've made 10 years of payments or less. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I see we have another comment from Catherine. So I, I recollect, Jack, that um, Heather Jarvis's presentation that she made about the federal program to legal aid lawyers is posted on our website. If that's correct, that would be another resource for people in the audience to get information and listen to that. But I, I might be incorrect. So no, you're right. Under under the our work and webinars tab, uh, there's a link to a YouTube version of her presentation as well as her presentation materials and about a hundred answered questions. That, that was a program specifically about PSLF and the limited waiver period. It was really helpful, I think. And so it's just a good source of information for people that are trying to understand what they need to do on the, the federal um, Department of Education website. Any other questions or comments on this agenda item? Okay. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you both for making time. I uh, sort of speaking for myself, but I feel comfortable speaking for many of my colleagues. We all agree that the work that you're doing is so important, uh, both around sort of the uh, student loan issues and making this a career option, a viable career option for sort of attorneys and just sort of your access to justice advocacy. We, we all really endorse it. So with that, I will sort of keep us trouncing forward. Uh, I will note that uh, Grace Hum has joined us. Welcome, Dean Hum. Uh, and I think our next agenda item is a, pro, a report on uh, lawyer assistance uh, program resources. Is that correct, Natalie? Am I moving back and forth in the right way? Absolutely. We'll be welcoming Lita Abella uh, from that program to uh, give us information directly about how the lawyer assistance program can be of assistance to law students and also to applicants. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to briefly give you some information. So my name is Lita Bell. I'm with the Lawyer Assistance Program, and I conduct outreach to law students, bar applicants, and attorneys. And what I'm here today is to give you some information on services that are available to your law students and bar applicants and your alumni attorneys. So I conduct presentations on substance use and mental health issues and how these issues can impair an attorney's ability to perform legal services competently. I discuss wellness strategies and the resources that are available to law students and bar applicants, such as our short-term counseling or personal counseling, dealing with stress, grief, relationship challenges and burnout. We also have long-term counseling in which the uh, participant would meet with one of our clinical rehabilitation coordinators online. It used to be in person, but now it's being conducted online. They would come up with a treatment recovery plan for the participant. They would find weekly group support sessions the participant can attend online and then find a therapist that specially deals with their issues, whether it's depression, anxiety, bipolar, eating disorders, whatever the issues are. And so I conduct these presentations for 1Ls during orientation week, to students during mental health week, to the three and four Ls during bar prep, professional responsibility classes, whatever is convenient for you and your students. It could be 30 minute presentation, 45 minutes, or anything in between, whatever is convenient that we can fit in. And also to your alumni attorneys, this would count for a one hour free MCLE in which they would receive their competency credit. I have handouts that um, have been provided to uh, admissions that they can pass out to you with the contact information to the general last email and phone number. And if there are any questions that you have, I'm more than happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Go for it, Natalie. Hi, Lita. If um, people don't have a flyer handy, can they also access the information about how to reach you or the Lawyer Assistance Program through the State Bar website? Yes, we have a wealth of information on the State Bar website as well. And we also have social media when we have uh, the free MCLEs that I give out, give for the attorneys. We post that on the, our social media channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I believe those are the, the ones that we post. And also if we have any particular events that are geared towards law students and bar applicants. Uh, I have a question. I, thank you so much for, for appearing today and, and the work that you're doing. I'm wondering if you sort of get evaluations, particularly from your student presentations and what the feedback is that you hear from law students about sort of the presentations you give. Yes, the feedback I get mostly from everyone law students, barbicans, and attorneys is, oh my gosh, why hasn't anyone told us about this program? I really needed it. As a law student, I would hear, I'm a 3L now. I wish they would have told me about this as a 1L. You, you cannot believe the issues that I've been dealing with and I needed someone to talk to. I didn't know who to reach out to. I really wish I would have known about this sooner. As attorneys, I get the feedback I get 90% of the time is, I've been practicing 10, 15, 20 years. This needs to be addressed in law schools at the beginning so that people know what they're getting into, that this is a high stress profession and that there's resources out there that can help law students and attorneys 
dealing with all these issues and especially during these last two years with the pandemic and COVID and, and everything else that we've been going through, um, mental health has just, it, it's, it's coming to the forefront now where more and more people are talking about these issues. They're willing to discuss these issues and that's what we're here for. We're here to help. Great, thank you. Uh, Don Smythe, go ahead. Uh, yes, and actually I'm surprised to hear that uh, you've uh, encountered so many uh, students uh, who are unfamiliar with the, the programs. Uh, I know at our school there's been significant concern with assisting students with counseling and all, all kinds of uh, wellness issues. And I, I wonder uh, if you've reached out to the right people at law schools. This is not something that's really in my own domain, but we have a, a dean of students and we've had a, an assistant dean of uh, students. Uh, and uh, I, I wonder if you've been uh, contacting uh, those people at the law schools directly. Yes, as a matter of fact, we have a quarterly newsletter that goes out via admissions that addresses the free presentations that I do. I send out emails to all the over 25,000 law students and bar applicants directly to let them know about the program, the presentation, the resources available. I've done videos, <laughs> social media. I have reached out to every dean and registrar in the state of California via email and other means of communication. So yes, I have done as much as I possibly can to try to get the word out. Okay, well, I, are you getting feedback from uh, these uh, emails? Are you having deans of students respond to you? I, I have certain schools that I'm there every year on the clock. I'm, I'm there every year for their orientation and that's a handful uh -huh. and the rest, no. Natalie, go ahead. I, I'm not short of questions today. Um, also, uh, part of the reason why we bring this to you is not only to share the information, but also to help us get to the right person in your school if we don't know. Sometimes it's a dean of students, sometimes it's another person. And so I would encourage any members of the law school council, but also any members watching in the audience today or on tape, if you uh, are interested in having a program at your school or you know a contact at your school that Lita should reach out to directly, uh, you can send um, that information to me or to the law school regulation box, if not to Lita herself, and we will be happy to make that connection. Um, so we really appreciate those contacts, or also we appreciate knowing the best way to communicate with your students. We know that that is changing all of the time. And uh, for those of you that are still doing some remote status that may have brought more changes, so we like to know um, what are students reading, what catches their attention, what medium, what software. Um, so please do continue to uh, keep us informed about that. It's very helpful. Yeah, I will note that uh, we sort of, I live in the academic support and bar world, but work very closely with our Dean of Students function and many other colleagues. And we sort of all have agreed that this is a flood the zone kind of approach because uh, the students who need to hear this information which is all of them, but they have to hear it multiple times over and over and over again before it really lands on them. A, a student in crisis who has sort of missed the, missed the information, it's almost kind of too late. So the more we can sort of broadcast from lots of different sources, the better off we're doing. And I certainly plan to share this information with uh, my other colleagues at, at Santa Clara. And in addition, how can you help us with that student that might say, well, I don't know if I should be contacting the LAP at this point. What if that later affects my bar admission, which will not be the case? Um, how can we reinforce that message and encourage utilization? Yeah, we definitely still get that question. It's the, and I've, I, you know, we just, this is our third day of class. I've already had multiple meetings with students who are convinced that their past uh, sort of therapy records will be combed through for the bar. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think largely it is because they read random things online and they sort of don't don't know who to ask. And so uh, we're definitely trying to sort of spread the word and I hope other schools are doing the same. Are there any other questions for Lita? Great, well, thank you so much for making time this morning. Thank you, take care.
Yeah. Uh, our next agenda item is recent developments. Uh, Natalie, what are the recent developments? Sure, uh, we have a couple of recent developments. Uh, the first one relates to the, uh, the e-oath card process. Uh, so first of all, thank you to everyone for hosting Rick Rankin from our, our IT department last time. Uh, we really appreciated getting feedback from you. We incorporated that feedback and hopefully you feel as we do that we had a very successful um, e-oath card season and we're finding that the, the bar numbers are being issued much more quickly um, in part through the proactive cooperation of the students um, and the law schools. Uh, I did get one reminder from the ARCR department that receives that information. Uh, if you are involved in a law school um, signing in ceremony, then they ask that you, um, if you're scanning the cards, please scan them as separate PDFs rather than a single PDF or send them in as the individual slips, whichever you prefer. Uh, that will greatly speed the work of ARCR um, and uh, continue to get those bar numbers out quickly to the newly licensed attorneys. Any questions about that before I move on to the next? I just want to sort of share that I was, I think I was the one at either the last meeting or the meeting prior to said, oh, the people who are going to be the problems in this are the judges. And uh, our judge, the judge who did our swearing in seemed to really like this. So, you know, my doubting Thomas, I sort of acknowledge I was wrong. And at least the judge that did our swearing in really liked it and it made it much easier for us. So. Oh, that's good news. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh, the second one is uh, for those of you who have applied to be on the law school council in the future, uh, the application period for both the law school council and CS bars is a little bit different and a little bit longer than the others. Um, the new members are chosen by the new incoming chair and vice chair of the committee of bar examiners. They have not yet been named. So uh, if you are in the audience and you have applied, thank you for applying. Um, and you will hear probably early in September. So we wanted to let you know that process was going on. Uh, each year we collect applications in the spring and they are chosen toward uh, the end of the summer. This is the last meeting of the committee year. And uh, we look forward to welcoming new members uh, at the next meeting of the law school council. Uh, the final uh, recent update is actually from Susan Bakshian. We'll ask for a very hot off the press update from the Blue Ribbon Commission that happened yesterday. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission is still proceeding. Um, we have been at it for a while. The timeline is to anticipate a recommendation to the Supreme Court and the Board of Trustees in early next year, early 2023. Um, we are at this time evaluating two options, which is exam options and changes to the exam and also non-exam pathways. Um, and I think at our last meeting, I gave you a preliminary update on the exam and that remains unchanged at this point. The exam changes that are being contemplated are that there has been preliminary support on the commission for both a reduction of the subjects matters covered on the exam and a de-emphasis on memorization. So those um, are still in progress. There is also, um, I don't want to use the word rejection, it's too strong, but we will, we will not be adopting the next gen bar exam, and that is not the current recommendation of the commission. The commission is operating on an assumption that California will have its own exam, but with some changes. And that is not yet final and not yet subject to a uh, recommendation, but that is where we sit on the exam part of the situation is a likely California exam, less memorization, less subject matter coverage. On the non-exam pathway, if you attended yesterday's meeting, all four and a half hours of it, um, and or you um, are looking forward to the recording, I'll give you the spoiler right up front, there's not yet a consensus on the non-exam pathway. And so what I would tell you on the non-exam pathway is we are at the stage of trying to reach consensus on how to proceed forward on this arguably more difficult um, pathway. And what we have come up with is that we will start the next meeting, which is in three weeks, with a discussion of some language and hoping to move toward a consensus of considering a non-exam or alternative type of pathway going forward. But the commission is not going to be recommending a particular path. Um, this, the commission is higher level 
So what we are discussing is sort of the adoption of an alternative and what might exploring that look like. Um, it has come under public scrutiny, and those of you reading the Daily Journal realize there's been lots of discussion about um, whether or not a non-exam pathway or the concept should be pursued or not. I would encourage you, if your school is interested in seeing a non-exam or some alternative pathways considered and explored by the commission or later commissions, which is also very likely for implementation of new programs, that you please submit public comment, um, as we have seen earlier with Natalie giving the updates on how to do that. Um, what I have seen so far is that really we only see a small amount of opposition from the organized bar and not a lot of discussion of what should we be exploring? What do you want us to look at and consider? I think academia is a quiet voice here and probably has some things to share. So please submit some public comments if you have them. Um, if you have not seen the Daily Journal coverage, I would encourage you to read it and not just because my own op-ed is in there, um, but because there's been a lot of coverage on the issue and I think it would be helpful to broaden the discussion and have more voices. So please consider doing that. We have lots of public opportunity both now with the commission, but more importantly, there will be large amounts of public op comment for anything the commission ultimately recommends to the Board of Trustees anything that the Supreme Court ultimately considers. So this is going to be a long process with lots of places where you might add your thoughts. I would hope that you do that, particularly because the commission has been unable to reach a consensus at this time, but that will be where we start our next meeting. So while we are not going to be in a position for the commission to actually decide what an alternative would look like in detail, we are very interested in knowing your um, either your support for an alternative pathway and what it might look like, and for any thoughts you might have on developing consensus at the commission on how we might proceed on this more complicated topic. I mean, I think it's a little easier to take an exam we've had for many years and think about improving it than it is to about be creating something new. Um, my personal thoughts um, that I will share separately just as a member of the law school council is uh, I remain deeply committed to reform, and I hope that we do both on the commission. So not speaking as a member, but speaking as me, the professor from Loyola, I hope that we very much are going to pursue some alternative paths and exam reforms. But if you have thoughts contrary to mine, supportive of mine, either way, please join the conversation. Great. Thank you for your personal opinion and for your opinion as a member of the commission. I, I share them as someone who is neither any of those things. So, uh, Natalie, go ahead. Um, and just a reminder for those who want to submit public comment, the example that I showed earlier is uh, where you would go to submit public comment related to rules. Uh, if you'd like to submit public comment related to the Blue Ribbon Commission or any other VAR Commission meeting, on the top of the agenda, you'll see the coordinator who should receive any written public comment. And there is also a public comment portion at the beginning of the meeting. That public comment portion is usually limited in the number of people that can be heard and usually to about two minutes per comment. So um, always that written public comment option is there and you can submit any time prior. So just wanted to make sure you knew there were two kinds. Uh, they are both welcome. Uh, please use them both freely. And just to add, um, I would encourage you to please, if you have comments, to add them soon. Our next meeting is September 3rd. If we are not able to reach consensus, we could see non-exam alter or alternative pathways um, not go forward. So if you do want to provide any support for non-exam non or alternative pathways, uh, it needs to be before the September 7th meeting. Yes, I was, I was going to say September 7th. I think you might have said September 3rd accidentally, but yes, the next meeting is September right. 7th. September 7th. <laughs> Too many meetings. September 7th is the next Blue Ribbon Commission. And if you submit the written public comments, that would be terrific. But of course, we would also welcome you. It, we have had a lot of public comment at those meetings, and we do almost always have to limit it to two minutes. Great. Thank you so much. Are there any sort of quick follow up questions for about the Blue Ribbon work? 
Thank you. Are there any other recent developments, Natalie? Uh, no other recent developments. Thank you. Excellent. So we already did agenda item E, so we're moving down to F, uh, which is a review of proposed wording change to the applicant portal regarding status of receipt of applicant certification from law schools. The longest name for an agenda item that I think we all are really actually excited to hear about. So I'll hand it off to whomever on the bar staff is talking about. Sure. So we'll recognize Selena Flores from our eligibility team, and uh, she is tackling probably one of the most common questions that we get from um, applicants when they're applying for the bar exam. We made some changes with you at the law school assembly the last time we met, as you remember, um, and she continues to try to um, enhance the process to make it easier for students and schools. But part of that is getting some feedback from you today. So uh, please put on your editor hat and welcome Selena Flores. Thank you, Natalie. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, great. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the process surrounding exam certification. For some of you, it may be refresher, and for some of I'm you- I'm sorry, it's... Selena, you actually have the display, like, so in your display settings, flip it to presentation mode, where it says display settings. I got it. Yeah, that one. Okay, got it. Okay, do you, you see my slide, or do you yes. see the- Yes, that works good. Okay, great. Okay, so for, for some of you, this may be a refresher, and for some of you, um, it may be something new, but overall, uh, we are hoping that this may be helpful for you, staff, and um, the law students. Okay, so first I'll go ahead and discuss what certification is. Um, I'll review the flow of the process, I will also talk about some challenges that we have experienced and uh, what we have done to resolve those challenges. And lastly, I'll talk about the request for all of you to provide feedback in an effort to improve the process uh, for all involved. That would be us, you, and of course, the law students. Before I move on, um, I'd like to get a show of hands to, um, or a thumbs up uh, to see if you have a role in the certification process and or are you familiar with the process uh, for certification every exam cycle? Yes, okay, great. All right, good. So for those of you who may not, um, the purpose of the certification is uh, allows the law schools to correct um, information that has been reported to us from the law students. So such as the uh, dates of attendance, it also allows you the ability to certify or not certify the applicant to have met the eligibility requirements to um, take the bar examination. Um, our request is that you send this along with a sealed official transcript um, so that we can confirm that the applicant has met the eligibility require requirements to take the exam. Oftentimes we may get the question from applicants about whether they can submit these on their own behalf and the question is yes. Um, a law student can decide to do that so long as the transcript has the degree awarded um, and that it remains sealed. So now that we've discussed the purpose of certification, I'll now discuss the flow of the process. So what prompts the certification process? Well, uh, it's that the applicant applies for the bar exam for the first time. And it's important to know that once an applicant has been deemed eligible to sit for the examination, the student will no longer appear on any future certification forms. So after a first time applicant applies for an exam, our office will send the certification request to the law school official email address six weeks prior to the final eligibility deadline. And after that, it will go out on a weekly basis. Um, and they will continue to go out um, as long as we are receiving bar exam applications. 
And it's important to ensure that your law school um, has an email address that is updated appropriately so that you can receive all email communications. We found that having um, an evergreen email is helpful and has proven to be so, especially under circumstances where staff is changing um, because the evergreen email address is not tied to a particular person. Um, in any case, any email address that is used uh, for you to receive official bar communication, uh, we suggest that it be monitored and or um, transferred to somebody else so that, we, so that you all can continue to get the email communications. Um, and you can always update your email address by emailing law school regulation at calbar.ca.gov if, if there needs to be a change to that. So not only is there steps that are taken between the office and the law school, but there are also steps that are taken between our office and the law student. Um, and the first piece of information that the law student receives is an acknowledgement email immediately after they apply for the bar examination. And the second is the visibility of information through their applicant portal. Um, and then lastly, if needed, um, if the eligibility documents are not received two weeks prior to the final eligibility deadline, the applicants will receive what we refer to as a missing, missing document email. And that email is sent to applicants two weeks prior to the final eligibility deadline. So we have discovered that there were some challenges um, and within the last few months, we have been provided feedback um, of certain challenges that law schools were facing related to the language that was included in some of these emails, um, specifically the acknowledgement and the missing document email. And as we became aware of these challenges, we worked together um, through two rounds of edits, um, one at the law school assembly, and then again um, in June, 2022, which was based off of comments that were received um, by email from law schools. Um, and so we worked together to uh, make these edits to, of course, uh, lessen the stress of law students who at that time are studying for the bar exam. Um, relieve you all from receiving unnecessary phone calls, all while keeping the applicants informed about the progress of their eligibility um, to sit for the exam. And so the highlighted portion of the acknowledgement letter is what you see on your screen. And as mentioned, this is something that they receive immediately after submitting their bar application. And so these highlights were suggested language that is now included in the current version. The new language provides further clarity about who is responsible for sending out the certification form, when it is sent, and when applicants should receive notification if their eligibility documents are not received. And so we're hoping this uh, will reduce questions, uh, reduce your call volume, and um, help the, the students um, identify when they should receive information about if a problem exists. The second line of communication, as I mentioned, is visible to the applicants through their applicant portal. The applicant portal can be accessed by applicants to submit applications, to submit specific or general inquiries, otherwise referred to as general requests, and it also allows the applicant to see a multitude of information as it relates to submitted applications and the overall admission status. And next, this is um, something that is visible to the applicant. Once they submit a bar application, they have the visibility of what is required. And these items are what is required for a bar application to be considered complete. And so a lot of times applicants will see that the legal certification is missing, the official seal transcript is missing, and they, although they receive the acknowledgement letter immediately after they submit their application, they are so worried about this missing documentation that is um, visible to them. And so what we currently have underway is to include 
information icons that will be placed next to the legal certification area and the official seal transcript um, to provide the applicant with a little bit more information that describes when this information should be populated. And the last piece of information, as I mentioned, is the missing document email. Um, again, this is sent two weeks prior to the final eligibility deadline. This communication um, informs the applicant that their eligibility documents have not been received and that they must be received by the final eligibility deadline in order for them to take the examination. So our goal is to work together with the law schools to reduce the number of applicants who, who actually receive this um, documentation email. And so um, I'd like to take this opportunity to think of ways and ideas together um, that we can reduce the number who received that email because it is a scary email to get, especially when they are setting for the bar exam. And um, my goal is to work together to help each other. Um, and some ways that our office can help you is to continue our communication updates between our office and the applicants based off of feedback received by all of you. And we can also remind you about up upcoming email blasts that will be going out to applicants that are normally scheduled to go out to them on a timeline. We can add information to our FAQs if you identify a commonly asked question from your law students. And we can also provide you with a schedule of deadlines of expected dates of email notifications. For example, the final eligibility deadline is always two weeks prior to the exam. And the missing document email is always sent two weeks prior to the final eligibility deadline. So I think just getting us all on the same page to recognize that these are upcoming expected email communications that are being sent out will be helpful to you, to us, and of course, to the law students. And so how can you help? Um, and so on the other end, I like to explore ideas about how you can help us. And there are several ways that you can help um, that would, and that would be to send uh, the transcripts and certification back as soon as you are able. It's possible that you may receive, receive several emails um, containing the certification request and that's okay. Um, you do not need to wait until all emails have been received in order to send your batch of transcripts to us. The reason for the multiple certif certification requests is based on the submittal of applications. So absolutely every single person who submitted an application prior to the first batch will be included in that initial request. So your biggest batch will be the first one. Um, we, of course, would like transcripts as soon as possible, and our staff is really good about processing them quickly, um, but it should be understood that if you wait to the final eligibility deadline to get that to us, there, there's a possibility for a delay uh, due to the volume of, of transcripts that need to be entered. Um, with regard to the acceptable delivery methods, uh, we only accept official transcripts by U.S. mail or hand delivery. All transcripts should be sent to the Los Angeles office. Um, if forwarded to the San Francisco office, we will get them, but to avoid any type of delays, they should be sent to the Los Angeles office. Again, we are always uh, open to feedback. If you have any suggestions um, about anything we've discussed that comes to mind, later on or anything outside of what we talked about today that might be helpful to the process, please feel free to put it in an email so we can take a look at it. Um, I will say that um, during the transition of our old uh, system to our new system, we did experience some of those internal um, challenges as well. And I believe all of those to uh, be worked out. Um, and so I'm, I'm open up to any questions, concerns or comments that you might have. Uh, I'll, I'll take the chair's privilege to sort of offer the first piece of paper, which is thank you so much for walking through this. We really appreciate the information. Uh, I am the sort of advising interface for our students around bar stuff. Thankfully, our registrar's office deals with all the processing of the transcripts. 
98% of the questions we get involve the actual portal when they log in and it says missing certification and missing transcripts. So uh, getting that little information button next to it that sort of says, hey, you know, your law school is going to send this to us, don't panic, would be great. The fact that you have told them when they sort of submitted their application, their brain does not recall that even if I repeat that. So, you know, the, the sooner and quicker that can be sort of rolled out, I suspect that that will alleviate a huge number of, of issues, at least in, in the world that I am in. Uh, Mary Beth Boylan, you get the next hand. I see. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Really, really helpful. Um, I had a question about whether a law school can have two email addresses that the information gets sent out to is there are we limited to one i know that our registrar gets this information and that's great because they are the ones doing the processing but i think it would be helpful for our bar support person or maybe our student affairs department also to be getting the notifications and reminders so i don't know if we're limited in how many people can get the blasts uh so that's my first question i have a second one <laughs> okay so let me let me just address that um so that is a question that has been asked and so um it's my understanding that uh there is a limitation on the uh number of emails that can that certain documents can be sent to um, but it's something that we can definitely uh, raise to our IT team to see if that's something they can explore. And Dean Moylan, uh, we've gotten that question before, and right now our system um, does just accommodate one email. And so the way that some schools have handled that is that they've used the evergreen email, such as the registrar at school.com, and then they have that on an automatic forward to um, any distribution that they might like. And then you can um, you can replicate that wish in that manner. Okay, yeah, that's helpful, and I'll look into that from our our back end. Um, the other thing I just wanted to clarify, and because I interface quite a lot on this with the registrar's office, because obviously um, our transcripts can't be ready until our grades are all complete. And so when I, as the associate dean, am setting the deadlines for when grades need to be in, it's important for my office to understand what the deadline is for getting the transcripts um, out. So I, I think what I heard you say, although the slide said something about two weeks before, but really it's four weeks before is when you need the transcripts in order for those missing document letters to not go out because you're sending those two weeks before the eligibility deadline, which is two weeks before the bar exam. That is correct. So as a general matter, it might be helpful for us to just communicate within our own law schools, but also maybe even on the associate deans, we have a little group of California associate deans or something like that, just to communicate that four weeks ahead of the bar exam is a really important deadline where transcripts really need to be fully complete to be sent so that our students aren't getting these scary messages. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Don Smythe. Unmute again. Uh, uh, I was just curious about how often uh, there is a failure for a document to be delivered uh, after a, a two-week notice is, is sent. Uh, is, is this a, a common problem? My, my recollection when I was vice dean is that the certification deadlines were only really an issue in one or two rare cases where a student who was supposed to graduate had failed a class and they were appealing the, the failing grade. How often does this happen that a document is not received after that, uh, that letter is sent? Well, believe it or not, it, it does happen. Um, now, 
So there's, there's two deadlines, right? So there's the deadline that the notification actually goes out to the law student, which as we, we just mentioned, happens at the four weeks prior mm -hmm. to the bar exam. Um, we only have a handful of applicants by the time the final eligibility deadline comes around that we are missing documentation for. But I think the main thing is trying to square all of the problems away and, and us actually receive that transcript four weeks prior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're struggling with. So it just, it just may be um, communication that needs to be relayed to the law schools. Yeah, so I was wondering uh, how often you, you get the document the day after the deadline uh, and whether that then proves fatal to the student's opportunity to write the, the bar exam. Do, does that actually happen? Uh, in some cases, it does. Uh, yes, and typically we see it happen with law students that are outside of California. Um, most California law students, we work uh, and we're very communicative with the law schools in, in squaring these away. And as mentioned, it may be only one or two um, after the deadline. If a registrar who is responsible for submitting the documents uh, 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 sent you an e email indicating uh, that uh, it had uh, sent uh, the documents before the deadline and you received the documents after the deadline, uh, it, would you respect that communication or, or would that prove fatal? You would, okay. So, so the registrars can verify that they have sent the documents to you before the deadline and that would prevent any kind of mishap. That, that's correct. Like as mentioned, um, we know the students are outstanding um, and at the time that the final eligibility comes around, there are only a few, um, and we are in direct communication with the law school about the situation surrounding the missing document. Super, thanks. Mm -hmm. Susan Maxion. Sorry about that. My camera and microphone suddenly decided to stop working. Um, I, I, I understand that we can't have additional emails uh, with all of the blasts and all of the inquiries. But I wonder, to follow up on Don's comment, if it is a very few number of students at the very end, that would seem less of a problem. But to avoid the, you know, for my, in my case, 300 people getting a notification that says they've not been certified for the state bar, I wonder, is it possible for there to be an email to us 24 hours or 48 hours before that's about to go out saying, if you think that you did this, you didn't. And maybe that email could go to more people because I understand that if all we do is send the general registrar email to lots of people multiple times, we don't solve the problem. Um, and your tech doesn't seem to want to do that anyway. But could it could we get some sort of notification to student affairs, to the dean's office, to the bar administration personnel, to most of us? Um, right before it's going to go out, like one final chance to get it in on time. So Susan, one challenge with that is that uh, while we do keep a record of the dean and um, the registrar or the official law school email, we don't generally have um, a roster of all of your internal current staff. And that's why we, we depend on the dean and the registrar. Um, so we've so far found that forwarding from an evergreen is, is the best, but we're always open to other opportunities uh, because yes, our favorite issue is one we have prevented. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, and I just want to sort of thank Selena for this presentation. And it sounded like you are open to additional feedback by email. Is that correct? I didn't mishear that. That is correct. Great. Thank you so much. Please, if you have other feedback or questions, please send Selena an email. Thank uh, you. The next uh, agenda item is reviewing agendas for the upcoming assembly and registrar's meeting from Natalie. Thanks, Devin. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. 
um, to talk about the upcoming All California School meetings. Uh, actually, I think maybe I'll do it this way. Um, I wanna talk about uh, the two meetings that come up in September. Uh, we have these annually. Uh, we have a law school assembly meeting, which is um, designed for the Dean of all California law schools, as well as other administrators who may wish to attend. Most often we've had deans of students, uh, those involved in bar support, or those involved in testing accommodation services attend this law school assembly meeting. Um, it's a full day meeting. And we generally focus on strategic initiatives there. Uh, we look to make an interactive meeting. We look to bring the experts that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis to you to share what they're working on, but also to get your feedback. Um, it's very important to us that this meeting be focused on the topics that are most interesting to you for an interactive discussion. There are many things that we know that are important to you where you already feel uh, fully informed. So the law school assembly meeting will be taking place on the 29th of September. Uh, we will be keeping the Zoom format. We started that at the beginning of the pandemic rather than the prior in-person format. But so far we've gotten feedback that that a Zoom format is really preferred. Um, and we've gotten much more participation than ever, even though participation was always high. Um, and I think Professor Kenyon, you've made some comments about the Zoom format before. Yeah, I, I just think it's so much easier for more people to be engaged to come and I imagine it saves the bar a lot of logistical work having to find space for all these people and put up with them in your space. So <laughs> I know you love us, but it's way easier logistically for everybody, I think. We enjoy welcoming you. Um, another thing we found is that um, sometimes there's a dean that wants to come for a particular intensive um, and they might be able to do that um, in this format. So I'll tell you a couple of things that we're thinking about. And if you wouldn't mind using your raise hand button as we show these, um, I'd be interested to know if you think this is a topic you'd like to hear more about. Um, you can think about it from the perspective of yourself and your own law school and your role, but please do think about the law schools in general. Um, what would you like California law schools um, to hear about? Because I know that each of you are in, in a diversity of roles on the commission, uh, which we appreciate. Uh, so we know that people will want to hear about the blue, the work of the Blue Ribbon Commission. I'm, I'm guessing that we'll see a, a full range of hands on that one. Um, and uh, I, I'd, here's another one where I'm, I'm not as certain. Uh, we can talk to you a little bit about some updates in the rules and communication, or actually the guidelines and communications related to those who have received a foreign first degree in law and are looking to qualify to take the bar exam here in the um, in California. Um, and so I wonder how many people think that that would be a good intensive. And I'm seeing three hands and I'm guessing that those are schools that might be offering the type of LLM program that could qualify uh, those applicants to take the California bar. I'm seeing a tentative fourth. Um, so it looks like we have a lot of interest in that program. Uh, we also plan to do an update on the provisional licensure program. If we're able to, one thing we will share is the demographic profile of those that have licensed through the alternative pathway versus those who have licensed through the traditional exam uh, passage. Um, are people interested in the PLP update? And I see that, yes, thank you. Uh, we will probably just widely communicate one more time um, the information about the public comment for the five-year validity that Donna was talking about earlier. We've discussed it today, but we will um, we we may bring that up again. Um, and then we'll also be bringing outside um, special guest Cynthia Jarvis. You saw a little teaser about that earlier, um, and she'll be talking about an intensive of incorporating LRAP programs in your school. How do people feel about that topic as a possibility? Definitely people are interested in that. So those are the ones that you uh, might not be surprised to hear about. Um, and I wonder if there are other 
topics or ideas that people have. And I'd like to um, encourage you to think about this in two ways. These are very high level strategic uh, proposals that we've talked about, but as you think about them, we also encourage you to submit the very specific questions that you get. So for example, the presentation that you just had from eligibility came from one of those very specific requests and we can handle them in one of two ways. Sometimes they lend themselves to a presentation the way that you saw here. Other times uh, we simply can handle the question. <laughs> and we're happy to receive it and do that. So essentially, no issue too large, no issue too small um, when we're preparing for this exam. And I know that some of you have submitted comments offline as well. Um, Dean Moylan. So one area, and I again, I don't know if this has been done recently or if I'm asking questions that you've all already discussed, but I, I think it would be really useful to if you haven't recently done a presentation on um, accommodations and exam accommodations, uh, we are seeing an increase of the number of students who have accommodations. I'm sure other law schools are seeing that as well. And I just think that is a, the trajectory is for more and more students to be getting accommodations in law school. I always tell students there's no guarantee that just because you're accommodated at law school that you'll be accommodated for the bar exam, but I think that some um, information and just a, a, a greater profile on what it requires and what students should be doing would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And it would be useful, like definitely sort of process information, but uh, it, it definitely feels to many of our students that those decisions seem very uh, all over the place, particularly if they've had prior accommodations from, uh, for MPRE or from LSAT. And so trying to, and I don't even know if this is a realistic thing, like you clearly can't use actual people as examples, but doing some hypotheticals to talk about why someone in X situation might have received accommodations and why someone might not uh, could really help our students and our sort of colleagues who do that disability advising to, to sort of put together those requests in, in a way that is, is going to be better for the students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one message that we, sh we are sure that you share with your students that we'd love to reinforce is that um, they can apply for uh, their TA portion uh, even before they apply for the bar exam and even years before. Um, so it's always good to remind them of that. And we know that you do. And if you have ideas about encouraging them, uh, we'd love to hear them. You just said TA. I assume that means testing. Oh, yes, testing accommodations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Other um, other thoughts or questions for the law school assembly? Susan. Um, I know we heard today from Andre about the bar exam and its administration in the live format again, but I think it might be worth another quick update. I know that there's no such thing as a perfect administration and that we're always going to hear stories about proctors making mistakes um, or about power going out or whatever it may be that's gonna happen. But I think it goes a long way if we just hear the bar say, here's what we're doing and we know it happened and we're fixing it. It doesn't have to be an acknowledgement that there was anything wrong, just that it's natural that there will be things that need correction or attention. Um, I think that might be worth a quick update. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and as we have been doing throughout the year, uh, we'll continue to make a, a call to the law schools at large. We want to make clear that we would like to hear from everyone, including those of you that are here in the audience or maybe watching, uh, watching this on the webcast. And to stay in the same realm, uh, but shift focus a little, I'll turn to the registrar's meeting. Uh, that meeting will be taking place on the 20th of September. And again, it is also a Zoom meeting, an all day meeting, um, and we will be working with the registrars, but other members of the law school community are welcome to attend. Uh, the last time that we held the registrar's meeting, you might remember that we did the first um, outside look into the State Bar's applicant portal that students use. We got a lot of excellent feedback uh, from that meeting. We hope it was helpful to you as well. And coming from that, we got a couple of deep dive questions. Um, the first one was uh, that that you saw Selena present upon today. And I wonder if you think it would be helpful to um, repeat that type of presentation uh, to the registrar's meeting at large. And can I see a show of hands about whether or not you think that would be good to share with the group widely? 
I'm getting a resounding yes on that one. Another specific type of question that we received, and the questions do tend to be more specific for the registrar's meeting, um, had to do with the moral character application process and the point at which the um, applicant receives the information about the live scan card. Um, maybe being able to see what the applicants see when they get to that point. And um, so that you've got that information to help counsel students. Is that a topic that is of interest to law schools in general? I would say yes. Okay, very good. Um, another thing would be the pass fail list. We can give an update about the pass fail list. One of the biggest items we have on our wish list that we will get to when we can um, is the distribution of electronic pass fail lists. We continue to experiment with ways that we may do that. Uh, we may give an update on that. That is not something that we have a timeline for yet, but because it is such a popular request that we probably will just give an update um, about that. And then finally, because we have a Zoom capability, we thought about potentially using the breakout room um, to talk about the registration process. As you know, we ask law students to register within 90 days of starting law study if they intend to eventually license in California. This is becoming more important than it has ever been as a means to communicate if circumstances change during a pandemic, for example but also to provide additional opportunities to students uh, to make sure they know upfront to keep their information updated to us, um, to let them know about opportunities that may come up along the way. For example, we recently created the State Bar Day for law students and we've been able to tell them about that through their registration. Um, so we thought about creating a, a series of breakout rooms for the registrars to talk about how we can encourage students to do that at different points in the process and um, why schools do or do not um, verify that registration right now and what we could do to support both the students and the school in that prompt registration. Yeah, so I don't know, I, I'll just say, I don't know that the breakout rooms are necessary, but definitely having a conversation about sort of that process. Uh, mm -hmm. Having just started school this week, the question I've gotten most all, which It'd be great for the bar to be able to sort of say is why students are paying a fee to create an account on a website that is uh the level of rage that i've gotten this week has been sort of unbridled at that specific issue okay uh that is good to know i i would also say that this is something that maybe some um registrars are doing and and obviously at different schools the registrars are more or less involved in the academic counseling of students our uh, dean of students office and our academic affairs office tend to be doing the ones on the front line of this more than our registrar at our school so i guess i would just say that if it's going to be discussed at the only the registrar's meeting that maybe we have a note that tells registrars to have their dean of students attend if that's who's doing this work that's good to know. And what we try to do when we send out the invitation is to give a tentative list of possible topics so that if they want to forward this to colleagues, uh, we encourage them to do so. And the Zoom format gives us a lot more flexibility to do that. And I think even the, the registrars meeting more so than the law school assembly, uh, we discovered that registrars have a diversity of duties. There's a core set that of course all have. Um, but then some have a very narrow responsibility, for example, in a large school, um, and others may have it distributed differently. Okay, good. Um, Susan? I just, uh, I'll share with Devin the, a similar sort of student upset over the fee. Also, the fee is causing some students to wait. Um, they are getting this notification to register within the first 90 days of school when all of us are asking them to pay their tuition in full, which their loan checks may or may not have arrived. And a lot of them are just, I, I hear from a lot of students who, when I find the group that didn't do it, the reason they didn't do it was they didn't have $107 or whatever it is right now. And by waiting, they completely forgotten it fell off their radar. I also have had a little better luck getting some folks to do this by telling them there's bad consequences if you don't. And the bad consequences, your MPRE score won't post automatically 
if you don't have a registered account. And I wondered if maybe we couldn't have that be more obvious somehow, or maybe the little like information button that she had today, if, that maybe there could be an information button that says, if you don't register, we're not gonna be able to post your MPRE score or other qualifications to your account or something to get students' attention. I don't know, this has been a, the bane of my existence and I'll, I'll admit to being one of the places that we're, we're just not getting this across and I don't, I'm running out of ways to try. And it sounds like the students may not understand that there's service involved in create in, in the registration on the bar process, that we're doing verification processes that can help them up front early. Uh, maybe it sounds like they think it's like creating uh, an Amazon account, a shopping account, and they're not sure. Um, and so maybe communicating the benefits and what we do is something that might be helpful too. Yes, I think it also might be a good topic for both all for the all school assembly and for the registrars, because I agree with Mary Beth, this is 10 different people at my school. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very good to know. And we're, uh, we're getting close to our time, but I will remind everyone um, to submit additional thoughts or questions, uh, whether you're here on the law school council or you're out in our audience, uh, so that we can include those um, in the upcoming meetings or, uh, or simply handle them. Great, thank you so much, Natalie. And uh, I will sort of, you know, triple it sounds like the, lots of folks are involved in this despite what various people's job titles are. So making sure that information about all of these meetings is shared with everybody on the council and broadly within the law schools. Uh, we have a great Dean who forwards lots of stuff along, but I know that that is not always the case for everyone. So more information about opportunities to contribute, the better. Good, I think that that is the end of our uh, agenda for the day, yes. Uh, so I think that we, unless there's something else, we will adjourn now at 1130. Is that right? Yeah. If I could just want add one thing, Devin, just completely yeah. um, off the record. If anyone just wants to talk to me about the Blue Ribbon Commission and their options, um, just give me a call um, or send me an email and we'll set up a time to chat. I'm happy to just talk with people off the record one-on-one -on -one as well. Great. Thank you for that. And thank you for your work on the commission. Great. With that, we are all done. Thank you all. We'll see you all again, I guess, in the spring when we have our next meeting. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.